Horned lizards were abundant through about two thirds of Texas. Where we're standing today, they've disappeared decades ago. There are still places left where horned lizards could thrive. We just need to help them get there. That's where the San Antonio Zoo's Texas Horned Lizard Reintroduction Project comes in. We want to restore horned lizards to places where they've disappeared, but there are benefits all along the way. Bring back the Texas Horned Lizard is about more than just nostalgia. It's really about trying to recreate the whole biome that was here a couple hundred years ago. Critical to the success of this effort is forming strong partnerships with landowners. We could not do this without their active engagement and long-term commitment. Right, well, welcome back everyone. I hope that you enjoyed wonderful networking and conversation at lunch. And welcome back to our online uh, listeners and viewers as well. Uh, remember, you can ask questions on the YouTube stream or at info at texanbynature.org. So after a phenomenal first panel, I'm very excited to get into the second panel of the day, which is a critical component of our future, and that is ecosystem thinking. So a lack of system level thinking or system level communication, and we even talked about this a little bit in the Q&A earlier, it's something that we hear and we observe and that we see in partner action, interactions, we see it in workforce growth, we see it in strategic planning. Um, there's just a, really a lack of seeing the entirety of your impact and the decisions that you're making, and not just looking at it in your own siloed worldview. We're all familiar with ecosystems, but the term even connotes something different depending on what your background is. Um, it's defined in two ways. So I actually looked this up because, you know, when, when we talk to our conservation partners, they're like, ecosystem, it's a system of natural organisms. And then you talk to our corporate partners and they're like, ecosystem, it's a supply chain or, an, you know, or it's, a, it's a financial network for us all to tap into. And then you have the groups talk to each other and they're like, ecosystem, why don't we understand one another? And so really wanted to get all of us in the same mind space today that we are talking about an interconnected system, whether it's a supply chain and that supply chain's impact on our natural resources, whether it is work on land and its impact on water and even carbon um, that is important to industry, it's an interconnected system across industry, across community, across conservation. So Texan by Nature has actually been exploring the application of ecosystem thinking by utilizing a, a framework that is familiar to most, and that's the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So we've been working over the past 18 months in partnership with our conservation wranglers and with our, our friends at Ecometrics to develop a report card that shows the value and the impact of local conservation through the lens of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So basically for our corporate partners who are making goals against that or talking to investors and shareholders and even your own workforce, it gives you a, a ready-made, this is exactly how local conservation plays into the work that we're doing and the goals that we've set for all. So if you wanna see more of that, um, you can talk to this year's conservation wranglers, they've been working on those. There are also examples out um, in the, the front area where you registered. But it's just an example as we embarked on this and had dialogue with our corporate partners on what do you wanna see, with our conservation partners on what can you measure and what trusted um, indices are out there. How do we put this all together succinctly so that we can move forward as one up at that system level we're excited about the opportunity. So the speakers and the projects on this next panel provided inspiration for this report card. And they're also working with each of you and their own shareholders in new ways. They are teaching next generation leaders to think differently. They're using their own academic paths to look at entire corporate networks in a new way. 
and they're using frameworks to make better decisions and positive and, and create positive long-term strategies for their organizations and communities. I'm so excited for you guys to hear from Hugh Simpson. He's the Chief Operating Officer at Texas A&M Forest System. Devin Hotzel, he is the Manager of Government Relations for Enbridge. Meghna Tare, she is the Chief Sustainability Officer at the University of Texas at Arlington. And Robert Horton, who's the Vice President of Environmental Affairs and Sustainability for Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Please join me in welcoming Hughes. Thank you so much, Joni. Thank you, Mrs. Bush, for uh, your leadership in establishing what a fine organization. And thank you to the entire Texan by Nature a team that has provided significant support to this partnership effort that I'm gonna share some information on. Uh, I was privileged enough to work with a 2021 Conservation Wrangler, uh, the Texas Longleaf team, and I saw firsthand the type of impact that the assistance from Texas by Nature can have on an organization, and so I jumped at the opportunity to submit another extensive application for uh, significant support. Uh, that's gonna pay significant dividends uh, down the road. And so um, I wanted to uh, kind of simplify the presentation that I have today into a simple concept. The whole premise of what I'm gonna talk about is the fact that the more forests we have on the landscape, the better our uh, watersheds are going to be and the better our water resources will be, along with numerous other co-benefits that these uh, resources provide. So Texas uh, gets about 40% of the surface water uh, flows through or originates on forest lands. And a large determining factor of why we have many of the national forest and state forest is that provision of water. And so we'll do a quick review of the Texas landscape. We're blessed to have over 60 million acres of forest and woodlands across this great state. Uh, the commercial uh, primary, the predominant commercial forests uh, are located in the eastern part of the state. And as many of you know, uh, one of the great things about Texas is that 95% uh, of the land is in private ownership and those landowners love being great stewards. The forest sector uh, is very significant to the Texas economy, uh, providing great paying jobs in many rural areas, uh, but also in some of the more populated areas with secondary manufacturing. And this particular industry, like many others, recognizes that sustainability is critical to the future long-term success of, of their business, uh, as well as the, the landscape. We talked brief, briefly about some of these co-benefits and, and these benefits are numerous. I've listed out a couple that are very important. A lot of, a lot of uh, recognition is, is occurring uh, on the role that forests have in sequestering carbon, providing habitat for wildlife across the state, uh, the aesthetics that we love and view and, and enjoy about Texas, recreation, already mentioned uh, water, which is gonna be a major focus of, of what I'm gonna share. Uh, Texas A&M Forest Service uh, produced a study almost 10 years ago uh, that attempted to quantify those ecosystem services provided by Texas Forest. And that figure at that time was $92.9 billion each year. And so it makes uh, these particular resources significant, not only from an economic, but also an environmental and social uh, impact. And so uh, what is the crux of this partnership? Why is it so important that we work together and collaborate with various organizations? Uh, similarly, about 10 years ago, the USDA Forest Service published a report uh, that was a culmination of an assessment that was conducted over many years that forecasted the state to, to lose up to 1 million acres of forest land uh, to other uses. And throughout this report, uh, we recognize and we have realized recently uh, with rising land values that not only are 
uh, these forest lands becoming fragmented, but they're also uh, being lost to conversion. And stressors that we see on a daily basis this year certainly uh, was no exception to the significant wildfires that the state experienced. We have stressors uh, from invasive species and, and other uh, impacts that are affecting the ultimate health of these particular uh, resources. And if you're looking specifically through a water lens, uh, some of the main concerns that we have uh, with the loss of forest lands is declines in water quality, uh, the changes in hydrology across the landscape, which can impact flood potential, and just general reductions in groundwater recharge and base flows in our stream. And so Sarah earlier set this up very well and, and how uh, the water security for this state is at risk in, in many areas. You know, you think about 30 million Texans, 1,200 of which move here every day, and a state that unfortunately has the, uh, di this distinction of being in the top three in number of natural disasters uh, that, that hit this, uh, this state. Um, you know, thinking back to the drought of record in 2011 when 97% of the state was an exceptional drought, even to uh, Hurricane Harvey when the National Weather Service had to add another color to the palette to indicate rainfall uh, amounts. The main thing that uh, kind of sobered us was the statistic that came about in the 2012 water plan, Texas State Water Plan, that indicated in times of drought, Texas would not have enough water to meet the anticipated demand. And from that point, our agency decided that it was time to get into the game, into the state uh, water planning game and state uh, water collaboration. We know that relationships matter. We know that collaboration is important. We're unable to meet all the challenges and opportunities that this state faces alone. And so it's important for us to partner with other organizations. We know that good land stewardship complements all the other traditional engineering-based approaches that come about uh, in terms of providing us with all of the necessities of our life. And so with that, in 2015, we established the Texas Partnership for Forest and Water, really to bring together the forest, water, conservation, and corporate sectors together to work on enhancing our forested watersheds to not only benefit water resources, but also local economies. And so why do we collaborate with uh, the drinking water sector? We know that our actions on the landscape can impact downstream users. And this particular uh, picture, I think, highlights that best. This is a picture from the W.G. Jones State Forest in Conroe, Texas. And the tributary that's flowing into the primary stream is coming off an adjacent property. And so we know that by working together with our neighbors and all across the state that we can uh, impact, have a significant conservation impact. A couple of opportunities that I wanted to share that this particular partnership is focused on is our Green Futures Program. And this is an opportunity for public, private and nonprofit organizations to come together uh, to implement uh, projects on the landscape that help um, add, add more tree canopy to the ground. These uh, generally engage our communities. Uh, they're held on uh, days of great importance like Texas Arbor Day, which is coming up on Friday. And we're hopeful that uh, our upcoming project uh, in the city of Princeton will not be rained out. Um, and one of the main things about this is these projects are scalable. We can fit uh, these particular projects to whatever scope uh, is needed from our partners. Some of the main points that uh, we've learned specifically from a data, data capture and reporting uh, perspective is first, where do you work? Uh, you know, this state is, is vast and, and opportunities can be endless. Uh, in order to have that impact, you've got to know where, where you're focusing. And so early on, the partnership followed 
some of the uh, national work that's being done uh, in a program called the Forest to Faucets. And so we looked at specific areas that uh, were surface water intakes that served large populations in which those forest resources were critical to that water supply and that could be threatened from a myriad of reasons, whether it's land conversion, wildfire, or insects and disease forest health concerns. Nextly, next, we need to understand what's important to, to measure. We know that um, we're past the time of just counting uh, conservation plans and acres and assist. We need to take that to the next step. What are the outcomes associated with those particular efforts and, and what is the impact? A couple of ways we look at the impact is through models. And uh, I was intrigued by a quote from a famous British statistician that once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And so I think that's how we think about some of these models is the fact that they can help us get to some of that impact. And a lot of work goes into it. This is one that we look at uh, is the iTree suite of tools that on a particular project that was conducted last year on Texas Arbor Day, uh, through the planting of 1600 native species, uh, this model was able to project out differing levels or cumulative levels of uh, runoff reduction and water savings through the planting of those trees. And uh, this particular model factored in uh, estimated average uh, mortality for these species in a, in a given year. And uh, the key thing about this is that these benefits accumulate uh, over time. And this model run was for 20 years. However, you think about uh, most trees uh, can live at upwards of 150 years, so uh, these impacts can, can increase significantly. And not only are the water savings uh, there, but also the co-benefits of carbon and air quality pollution removal. And so uh, additionally, some best practices that we have learned about for engaging partners, whether it's you know, landowners or water utilities, or conservation groups or corporations is that talking in their language, understanding what's important to them and adapting the message so that it uh, meets that, uh, that need. Uh, we recognize the importance of talking through trusted sources. Sometimes these are the uh, conservation organizations or the associations that represent groups. So like the Texas American Water Works Association or the Texas Rural Water Association, or the Texas Forestry Association. All of these are key partners. And so how do we continue to advance this partnership? What is needed for us in order to take the next step? Uh, right now, uh, this particular partnership has been staffed uh, by existing personnel taking it on as an additional duty. And so we recognize that having a dedicated person that can commit their time to this particular effort can uh, significantly advance our work. And I'm pleased uh, to, to share that we have that person hired and they're starting in a couple of weeks. So look for great things uh, coming. Uh, having champions that support your, your effort. So Drew Molly is the current chair of the Texas American Water Works Association. He recognizes this connection and the importance of forest to uh, water. So how can you uh, in the audience get involved in this type of, type of work? Um, Sean mentioned earlier how they uh, plant trees through the National Forest Foundation. I think that's a great approach. There are other opportunities as well. Uh, the tree recovery program that we administer helps to uh, restore tree canopy in communities that have had uh, disasters, natural disasters come through. And so it's a great opportunity to continue that effort. TechSWAC was another one that was mentioned uh, earlier. That's a, a significant opportunity to engage. Uh, individually, I would say uh, attend and, and participate in uh, local planning initiatives, whether those are watershed protection planning efforts or uh, land use planning uh, is, is an opportunity to uh, engage locally. And then lastly, I just wrap up by saying that it is my belief that everybody takes responsibility in ensuring Texas has clean water uh, in the future. And so we all have to do our part. So 
with that, uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to start off by saying, Mrs. Bush, Joni, Texas, Texan by Nature team, congratulations. I mean, this is, this is fantastic. We've been at this for five years, and I'm looking at the room. It's packed, 600 people between online and in person. I mean, this is fantastic. So, so yet another great year, congratulations. I also want to make it known now, early on, that leading up to this event, Jenny Burden threatened my life numerous times if I were to exceed the 15-minute time allotment. <laughs> And I'm a public affairs guy with a microphone, so that's cruel and unusual punishment that she's doing that to me. But if I'm not at the afternoon sessions or at dinner, you know how it went down. Um, so start off here. This is kind of the structure of what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to go through Enbridge as a whole very, very quickly. And the reason why I'm going to, this slide's up here, is more so just to give you guys a scale of the company to understand how complex we are. And then I'm going to go through a couple of what I call mechanical projects. And this is all kind of under the ESG energy transition lens. And then I'm going to transition into what that means from an ecosystem perspective, what our corporate ecosystem looks like, and then get to the, what I, you know, the meat and potatoes of the remarks, which for this crowd is the nature-based solutions of it. So we're going to go through those real quick, and I'm going to spend most of my time on the nature-based solutions. But this is a snapshot of Enbridge, okay? So um, what you need to get from this slide is we aren't small. I think someone on the last panel is we're, we're a large energy company. Uh, we move 20% of the natural gas consumed in the United States, 25% uh, of, uh, of crude oil in North America. And our, our power business unit, we've got an excess. It's actually more than 1.8 gigawatts of contracted renewable energy. So we're a large, complex energy company, and uh, that means that we have a large, complex ecosystem. Uh, this is our ESG goals. In 2020, we, uh, we released our ESG program. We formalized it and we set goals for ourselves. Not entirely unique to us, but it's something that we're extremely proud of and that we're, that we're executing on very, uh, very aggressively. And as you'll see up there, we're gonna, you know, our goals are to reduce our carbon intensity by 35% in 2030 and then net zero by 2050. So everything we're gonna talk about from this slide on feeds back into that because ESG, when you're talking about an ecosystem, is gonna exist at the center of that, which this slide, this slide is going to show you. So this is an extremely rough illustration of what it looks like. And this is not, this is, this could be used for lots of corporations, if not all corporations. But these are some of the groups in our company that execute their jobs, go straight to the bottom line, but they're central to us to be able, they're central for our ability to be able to execute the business in which we operate. So if you go through this supply chain we've talked about today, environmental sta safety, stakeholder engagement, which is kind of what I, what I touch on, business development, creating new projects, all of this, we have put ESG at, the middle of, ESG at the middle of that. So what does that mean? Okay, we're gonna go into some of the mechanical projects that, that serve to meet these, these uh, ESG goals. Green pipelines, so we operate pipelines as I mentioned, oil and gas pipelines. So one of the things that we've tried to do is go back and look at this and say, okay, this is, our, this is our network, this is our business. What can we do to help us advance toward these goals? And one of the early and very successful programs that we've, that we've been executing on is our green pipeline program. And what we're doing in this program is we are going to our compressor stations along our gas uh, system, and we are installing solar panels to be able to fuel the power that is, or provide the power that is needed to operate that station. This might sound obvious or basic, but it's actually something that, 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 that required a whole lot of work from all of those groups that I just showed you on that ecosystem. It required all of us to sit down and think, okay, what can we do, can we do it, and how do we do it? So this was truly an all-company effort to be able to understand, will this work? Will it even make sense to us? We are, we are a, a, a company, for-profit company, so we have to understand if it's going to be something that's going to help us or hurt our bottom line. Does it help us advance toward our ESG goals? And can we even execute in the first place? Is it even meaningful? Um, so we've been working on that, and we have two projects. We've got more, more than that that are fixing to be uh, under ex or in execution. But we have two projects that, that we have executed on, and we're seeing great success with that program. 
Um, this is something that we look to continue to do, and there are other mechanical projects, again, as I call it, that, uh, that we're going to pursue. You hear about carbon capture sequestration, uh, you hear about hydrogen, we're playing in all of that. I'm just focusing on one today because, again, I want to get to the nature-based solutions and, and let you know we're, that's one part of this when, it looks at when, we, when we consider the ecosystem. So going back to this again, because this is the whole reason why Joni brought me up here, what I'm about to get into is the question of the day. How do you pull your entire company into a strategy that has previously largely been ran by kind of your community investment stakeholder engagement group, which was the case for us. Years ago, and I've, I've been doing this for about 15 years, years ago when it came to community uh, investment, community engagement, you would see a company like mine make a financial investment. Financial investments are huge. I don't think there's a single conservation organization in this room that say, no, I don't want your money, um, or no, I don't want money. But the question that, that we've been confronted with in recent years, and this is, you know, made, makes the job much more meaningful is, but what else can we do? We're a huge company. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of opportunity. We have a lot of land and assets. How can we leverage the size and weight of our company to help those organizations rather than just cutting a check? There's a colleague of mine in the room who I won't mention her name, but her name's Erin Casey Gonzalez. She likes to refer to it as you know, playing Oprah, like you get a check, you get a check, you get a check. How can we move past Oprah-itis and actually get into a real partnership? Yes, money's good. We're always gonna be able to provide that to our partners where it makes sense, but how can we actually go in and truly create a partnership by putting some skin in the game and working with them? The only way to do that, and guys, I'm not gonna sit up here and tell you that we have all the answers. Um, I should because my boss's boss is in the crowd, but um, what we have here is a working question. It's a working riddle that we're working on right now. How do we pull in all of these groups, leverage the expertise of these groups to benefit, not burden, our partnership organizations? I'm about to provide you a case study that is underway. Again, we don't have all the answers, but it's underway and it's something that we're working on. So some of the folks in the crowd will be familiar with the Friends of RGV Reef. This is not Enbridge's project, it's a project that Enbridge Vehemently, we, we support this project we have since 2017 and we're huge, huge proponents of it. They are a Conservation Wrangler Award recipient uh, and the folks that we work with at the Friends of RGV are fantastic. They're truly a grassroots organization. They do this when they're not doing their day job. And what they have sought to address is off of the coast of Brownsville and the RGV uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, the seafloor has become featureless. So all the protection and, and, and uh, and features that used to be on the, on the sea floor have, have gone away for a variety of reasons and there's no protection for the younger species of snapper. And because of that, we've seen the snapper populations just you know, disappear and others, other, other fish species as well. So these guys got together and they're like, well, how can we fix this? And one guy was like, well, maybe we should put stuff on the bottom of the floor and they did that and now it's, 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 it's a huge success. Um, so it's been something that we've been contributing to for a while. We've been supporting them. In 2017, we gave them a fi financial donation. And then ever since then, we've been working to say, yeah, but what else can we do, right? We gave you, the, we, we gave you money. We're proud of it. We're, we're promoting you. But what else can Enbridge do? So one day, Gary, who is the founder of the Friends of RGV Reef, and I were talking. If you know Gary, he, he talks more than I do. So a five-minute conversation with Gary is two and a half hours we started thinking, well, there's this huge economic impact and all these benefits as shown in this slide up here. I'm not gonna read through them. But we already know that the reef is a huge success. We already know the economic impact. We know the tourism. We know the, the, the biodiversity. But, but what's, what else is there? And he asked the question, well, what, what is, you know, what's on Enbridge's mind? And what I said was, is there any chance that these new species or the re regenerating these species helps to offset carbon? He was like, well, of course it does, idiot. These are, you know, we're, any sort of sea life has some sort of uh, carbon offset. But then the question was, has anyone actually measured that? And the answer was, shockingly, no. There hadn't been any research done on that yet. So then the wheel started spinning. And so what we came up with um, was, let's fund a study. More than that, not, let's not only fund a study, let's fund that study and start bringing in grad students, high school students, community members, elected officials to let them know that this research is underway and let's start shaking that tree to understand what opportunities are out there. 
So we just recently announced um, earlier this year the, the investment we made to fund that research, and then even more recently, we just announced that, that study is now underway. And the sole objective, this, the sole objective of, the, well, there's two objectives, I should say, of this study are, number one, we wanna quantify the biodiversity. Biodiversity is key when we're talking about nature-based solutions and carbon offsets, right? If you've got a diverse ecosystem in the Gulf of Mexico, that's a good thing, right? Like there's not really much of a debate on that. But the question is, we know, there's, we know from a biodiversity standpoint, this is a huge success. Now let's figure out what is it doing for carbon offsets? And we're going to hopefully be able to take that methodology and the product of that study and then share it with other conservation orgs, other academic institutions who are also examining this same question just in different arenas. So there's a lot of this is being done kind of near shore. There's a lot of this being done in forests and in, in onshore type resources. This is the first of its kind when it comes to offshore reef, particularly man-made, but offshore reef resources. So do we expect that this study is going to say, hey, guess what, you're offsetting whatever, X million, 100 million, tens of millions of, of carbon? No. But we do think that we're going to be able to prove the concept, take that out, extrapolate it, and build on it, and continue to research it to understand what other projects are being done out there that haven't thought about it this way. I always refer to it as reshaping the lens. We didn't come to the reef because we thought carbon offsets. We came to the reef because we thought these guys are awesome. They're passionate. This is a grassroots group of folks who are out there trying to make a huge difference in this incredibly important environmental resource that, that matters so much to, to residents of the RGV and really all of Texas and North America. That's why we came to them. And then we said, well, let's reshape the lens. What are we missing? Let's not go try to find another partner. Let's go back to our partner that's already doing great work and see if there's something else here. And we're hopefully in the next year or so, we're gonna learn more about what that is, that we're, you know, the, the product of that study. And our intent is through organizations like Texan by Nature and, and many others in this room is to share that information and say, what else can we do? Now, the whole point of my discussion today is what, what does Enbridge do with all those groups on that ecosystem that I showed you earlier? And here's how it looks. So we've got operations. Our operations director is in the room tonight. His name's John Goddard. He's a fantastic individual. He doesn't have a Texas accent, but he's a good guy, and you should talk to him. He's got a lot of knowledge. What, what, what can they do? These are the guys who operate our, our, our equipment on the ground. They live and work in our area. What can we do? Well, we're, gonna, we're, we're going to bring in some of these local communities. We're going to bring in some of these schools where our employees live and, they're, and, they're, and their kids go to school because we want to be able to educate them. Hey, this is going on in your backyard, and this might also be an opportunity for you. Have you ever thought about joining in on the study? We're going to hopefully get them out on a boat, see what's going on, and let them know about it. I think that's crucial for high school students and certainly college, but high school students to understand that this is going on. HR. When it comes to energy transition, look, there, this is where Jenny's really gonna start sweating because I could talk about this all night. When it comes to energy transition and conservation, the workforce and the skills discussion is huge. We are talking about a huge opportunity to develop skills for what is going to be the energy use and the energy technologies of tomorrow. And it is something that we need to be working on now to be able to get folks ready for that. So I, I look at this as, yeah, it's a great conservation organization, but from an HR standpoint, is there a workforce opportunity here? And the answer is probably, maybe. Let's bring in our HR to understand it. They should be aware of it. They should have skin in the game so that we understand and so that we can go out there and, and, and work through our HR to say, hey, here's, here's why we're doing this. Here's some of the skills. And yeah, oh, by the way, we can bring some of our own employees to kind of educate folks on this is why we made this investment. This is why it matters to us. This is why we have ESG goals. And this is, this is how, we, how we execute on nature-based solutions. Legal, supply chain. The, <laughs> Sean from the supply chain presentation earlier, uh, it, was, it, was, it was great to hear him, hear him talk about it. We, have a, we spend a lot of time in our company on supply chain about what, what should we be doing from a procurement uh, perspective about getting who do we who do we buy from? What is their focus on ESG? What is their record? You know how do how do we leverage that record to show advancement toward our own goals? It's the same thing here. So when we're building a pipeline, it's not an obvious connection to anyone that a pipeline is going to create some sort of habitat for red snapper, except for the fact that Gary and the guys at the, at, at the Friends of RGV Reef said, wait a minute, we can take that metal 
we can drill holes in it you know, and, and clean it and then sink it and that becomes protection for these juvenile uh, uh, red snapper species. So we work with our supply chain, we say, can we donate excess pipe? And they say, not only can you, please do it because it actually ends up being cheaper for us and that's okay. It can be a mutual benefit thing, right? If it's good for our organization, it's good for us, that's a win-win. So we were able to work through that and we were able to donate some of this excess pipe to them and get it installed. That's exciting stuff. Legal has an arm in that because they have to work through the you know, liability and the transportation agreements to be able to get it out there. My point of all this, and I'm seeing now that I have seven seconds, um, is, is, I'm so sorry, uh, is that, is that there is, uh, what it's taken for us to start getting further along in this conversation is it's just taken us to sit down at the table and, and, and ask some hard questions and start thinking. Organizations like Texan by Nature play an invaluable role in that. And the reason why is, I, I look at Texan by Nature as a table. We're able to sit at this table with conservation orgs, with academia, with other industry partners, and we're able to have conversations that we don't necessarily know all the answers to, but we're willing to have the conversations. And that's a huge deal. We do it internally. We're trying to do it with our partners, and we're gonna continue to do it. And uh, again, I don't have the answers. I don't have compelling data. I will maybe next year. Um, and uh, it's an exciting thing, so I'll, I'll stop there and uh, look forward to the Q&A. everyone. I promise to get you through this without reaching for that cup of coffee. <laughs> uh, my name is Meghna Tare. I'm the Chief Sustainability Officer for UT Arlington. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, Lady Bush and Joni, for having me and giving me this platform to talk about uh, ecosystems. And it's a privilege to work and collaborate with most of you in this room. Um, it is an honor that we get to participate uh, on forums like this and to get to work together on a lot of projects uh, for North Texas. So I started, um, when Joni invited me to talk about ecosystem services or ecosystem thinking, I pride myself on a big idea person, but boy, was it really hard to put that in context with 15 minutes of how we do this uh, for Texan. And um, I feel like a mediator in this room between the private sector and the public sector. You know, an educator here who might have some of the answers for Devin's uh, workforce solutions, uh, workforce uh, need, but um, as the world is getting ready for COP27 in four days, um, I'm really glad that here in Texas, we are having this conversation, this broader conversation about ecosystem thinking and it, how it fits and how Texas fits into the broader perspective and the bigger conversation, because it's not easy, right? Um, we all have this utopian ideals or idea about what your personal journey is or what your professional journey is and how long it takes to get there. And we all have a way of building towards that. And it's often messy. You, the, fuzz, the picture is very fuzzy till you get to the top and realize, okay, I did good. And I have uh, good people working with me, right? So that's the reason we are here to talk about how ecosystems thinking guide some of the conversations and discussions that we are having um, as we move towards uh, climate action on a global scale. Um, so as I started working uh, about this, I, you know, we sustainability professionals always get uh, siloed in our work of sustainability. I know everything, I have all the answers, and I know exactly how sustainability uh, is defined, right? But I'm an educator, um, I teach um, uh, introduction to sustainability for undergraduate and graduate students at UTA, I'm a practitioner too, uh, but it's very hard to make that connection, and I always start my class by uh, telling my students about the precautionary principle, right? Um, those of you who have read environmental economics or conservation books, you know that the principle talks about the fact that um, you need to take a precautionary action. It's a cautionary uh, proactive way of dealing with your uh, challenges. Basically, you are assuming that uh, it's better to be safe than sorry and take action, assuming that your actions are going to help the environment in the long run, whether or not you believe um, uh, the negative impacts, right? So sustainability in general, there is so much of overlap, but at the same time, it's different, right? Because um, in conservation, we are talking about the negative impacts of human on the environment. Uh, in conservation and in sustainability are trying to negate those environment, uh, those negative impacts, right? So as I started thinking about this, 
I was wondering, so we are here talking about conservation, so what exactly are we trying to conserve? Are we trying to conserve natural capital, which of course we are, because our existence relies on it, or are we trying to conserve human capitals, you know, all of us in the room and so many more, right? And I think the answer is both. We are trying to do both conserve natural capital and human capital. And the reason for that is because in a recent study published by the World Economic Forum, they put a value of $44 trillion on ecosystem services. Um, half of the world's GDP relies on ecosystem services, and that's the value on your ecosystem, right? So everything that you do has an impact from the food that you had for lunch, or the car that you drove, or the air conditioning that you will turn on. Everything that you use has a value, and we as humans don't put a dollar value to that. And as we move into this conversation, I think it's important to understand what is the dollar value for the humans who are working towards all this thing besides the dollar value for the natural capital. And kudos to Joni for putting together a panel on human dimensions. You know, you, you rarely go to conferences which are talking about human dimensions and ecosystem thinking. So, so this is amazing to be part of this bigger conversation um, uh, at Bytex and by Nature. Um, sustainability is such a, a big word, and um, how do you make that connection with what everybody is doing, you know, from operational uh, to managing your uh, HR personnel, right? So how many of you know or have read this quote? Raise of hands. I see one, two, three, four, maybe six, seven, ten people in a room of 200, right? And, you know, a few more folks online. Well, this quote is uh, by the father of the conservation movement, John Muir, right? In the early 1800s and uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, he put this forward, this inspiring message, uh, which talks about sustainability as we relate to it now, right? Everything in your system is interconnected. And when you pick one thing by itself, it impacts everything else. Or when you work towards something, it helps everything else. So the fact that um, Tevin is working on ESG and operational sustainability, it's part of the bigger conversation on climate change, uh, which he talked about, and so is everybody else, right? But I think people had figured this out in 1800, and we are just you know, getting on with the bandwagon and getting on the train right now and working on sustainability. So um, we all know Texas is growing, right? I have seen so many numbers. There are um, flyers outside which talks about that the Texas population is going to be um, 70 per, in, doubling by 2020, increasing by 70% by 2070. The world population is going to be 8 billion this year in November, in a month's time. So no matter how you put it, how beautiful your graphics are or how beautiful my slides are, it is not a rosy picture. We are headed towards a crisis within Texas, but also globally when the world population is going to be 8 billion, right? And Texas is growing. We all know that, right? There's no denying that. Um, the fact that five of the 20th fastest growing cities are in Texas, DFW is growing at a re really rapid rate. So how do you put this in context of what you're trying to achieve at work, right? Surviving and sustaining yourself, right? Um, it's not easy. Some of these figures, like I was reading in the um, document this morning, that 45% of uh, Texas water demand is going to be met by conservation practices. That's a, that's a big number, and that is something to pay attention and uh, work towards. Um, so, did I skip a slide? Um, so we all talk about uh, conservation in context of operational sustainability, right? But if you put together sustainability and conservation, we always operate on these three pillars of sustainability, right? Social, environmental, and economic. And there's a reason I put it in that order, because that's usually the order that people pay attention to, right? Economic is always at the top, environment is eh, because it is what is leading to your existence, and social is something that gets left behind, but it is an important part of the conversation going forward, right? Um, and so how do we include all three of this in your, uh, in your um, conversation and operational strategy? I don't know how to go back. All right. 
So everybody talks about operational efficiency, right? This is something, uh, is your bread and butter to survive, right? How good am I in terms of my energy efficiency? Am I offering transportation programs like car sharing or EV charging station or passes to take the DART? Do I have programs for employee engagement like office green team programs? Am I reducing my waste, right? And this is not just the trash that you're diverting from the landfill, but also the food waste that is getting composted or diverted from the landfill. These are the things that everybody in their everyday business life or uh, uh, business strategy tries to focus on, right? But I think we have to move past this, where this is uh, a necessary uh, you know, part of your job requirement, I will say, to do all these things, but you have to do more, right? Going forward as we focus on conservation, um, and so, you know, well, you can't put a sustainability expert on the stage and uh, not give her a chance to talk about my numbers, right? I'm going to have one slide which talks about UTA success, right? UTA is a campus that has 60,000 students, 110 buildings. Some of them are um, as old as 1960s, right? We have... Um, uh, 420 acres of campus, our energy efficiency is great, our uh, energy utilization index is great. We have a 17.1 billion impact on the Texas economy because 65% of the students that graduate from UTA reside in Texas and they contribute to the economy. So it's important for me to measure my human impact. I'm an educator, students are my assets and I have to measure their impact on the economy and the environment, right? So this is for UTA, community engagement. Texas has lots of programs, which many of you here has, have worked with on uh, initiatives with the Urban Institute, which guides uh, locked off local government on policy implementation or design, redesigning of the corridor, right? So this is for UTA. Some more numbers, right? Um, uh, we have a transportation program, we have energy efficiency, we divert 39% of the food waste from the landfill because we have an on-site composting program. We have a food recovery network where students are actually picking up the leftover food from the cafeteria at the end of the day and donating it to Salvation Army. Because to me, it is not just about diverting the food waste, it's about my social impact in my community that UT Arlington resides. That's equally important to me. The social pillar is as important as the economic and the environmental pillar. Uh, so how do, you, how do you integrate all of this in your strategy, right? There are tons of frameworks out there, right? Most of you have heard about uh, ESG, but why is it important for you to actually pay attention and incorporate those frameworks in your day-to-day -day operations, right? First of all, um, the business is here, the customers really pay attention. I mean, most of you will pay attention to the kind of products that you buy or the kind of food you shop in the grocery store. Um, and so customers pay attention to what you are doing in terms of ESG or sustainability practices, right? Your shareholders care for it. And I also think that it's in your interest because it helps you create a baseline for data through which you can measure your progress as you set you know, five-year goal or 10-year goal and improve because what you cannot measure, you cannot change or improve, right? So it's important to have those kind of a framework to guide your decision-making process, which also helps bring your management on or top bosses being part of your mission and vision for their organization. So it's important to put this in paper to get every person from your team to be part of your uh, vision for the organization. And so there are tons of um, uh, frameworks out there. You know, ESG, we talked about GRI. We talked about some people implement environmental management system, you know, the 14,001 standard or the OSHA standard. There are science-based targets, nature-based solutions, uh, VLRs, voluntary local reviews. So pick and choose. Tons of options out there that can guide your strategy in conservation and sustainability based on whatever is applicable for your uh, business operation. And for me, this, is, this wheel is what guides my work at UT Arlington. I'm proud to work for an organization that really pays attention to the sustainable development goals, right? The UN Sustainable Development Goals. And I'm so proud to be here to know that all the work that Texan by Nature is doing is aligned with UN SDG because this is my North Star. Everything I do at UTA in terms of sustainability, I align with all these 17 goals that are out there. Uh, 
from zero hunger that the Maverick Pantry I have or the food that is donated on campus to the partnership, the fact that I'm here talking about collaboration and education, every strategy at UTA is driven by UN Sustainable Development Goals, and I'm really proud of that. And here are a few examples, you know. The I has become such an important part of every discussion, right? I model, I naturalist, an app to track um, all your natural resources or plants uh, on campus. We have done that. Food recovery networks, sustainability mapping, bike share program. Uh, most of you here know that UTA launched the Regional Center of Expertise for Education on Sustainable Development Goals in 2019, which is a program of the United Nations University. Texas is one of the seven RCEs in the US and one of the 179 RCEs in the world. So we literally put Texas on the map when we launched a regional center that is focusing on sustainable challenges for the region using the UN Sustainable Development Goals and education as a tool, right? And I'm very proud that I get to work with a lot of folks in this region on that platform. And last year we launched a North Texas Food Policy Alliance that is talking about addressing the equitable food challenges for the region through education and capacity building. And so uh, my last slide was, so what, how do you go forward from where you are? I mean, you have to improve um, going forward. And so what are the next steps for conservation? A lot of folks have talked about collaboration, capacity building, which is all good, but I also think we have to explore finance models. You know, like payment for ecosystem services. It has proven to be a really successful model for countries like Costa Rica, for lots of private organizations. I think everybody here struggles with funding for um, their projects and for their initiatives, and I think it's important to explore uh, big global models like payment for ecosystem services to drive some of our uh, conservation wor uh, work going forward. And then the fact that we are here talking about our challenges and how we move ahead, that's a great start. So thank you so much for having me, um, and I'm uh, excited uh, for the Q&A. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Horton, uh, and I work at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Mrs. Bush, thank you again for the foresight in starting this amazing organization, Texan by Nature. Also to uh, the staff, Joni and staff, you do incredible work, and I'm also fortunate to work with an incredible uh, set of colleagues on the executive board of directors uh, for Texan by Nature, amazing individuals who are passionate and care about the work that we do here. So um, ecosystems thinking, um, this is a very interesting topic to me, very personal to me, and if you can't tell, I'm very passionate about it. Um, uh, it also inspired my current journey in academia, so I'm doing my doctoral work at the University of Florida studying this topic. So for those of you who happen to live somewhere that doesn't know who DFW Airport is, we happen to be right smack dab in the middle of Dallas and Fort Worth, owned by the two cities, uh, bigger than the island of Manhattan. Um, this past year, we were second in terms of annual passenger numbers. And one of the things we're really proud of, we were the first North American airport to become carbon neutral in 2016. Um, I have to say that, thank you. In addition to that, we have an excellent partnership in Texas with uh, Austin Airport, who is the second carbon neutral airport in Texas, and also one of uh, three in North America, or three or four in North America. So um, I think Sean showed a slide with a pale blue dot, uh, a view from space. This is zooming in a little bit closer. Uh, it shows human activity from space. It's a NASA video that if you look it up, it's pretty uh, interesting to look at the patterns that you can see. So obviously the lights uh, in some of the areas are not aware of the Lights Out Texas program. Um, but anyway, this, this is an interesting view, right? Because you can look at human activity and how we consume resources globally. This is another view. If you zoom in a little bit closer, you can see patterns of human development. You can see the cities and the intensity of the lights. And if you look at it over time, you could see how those cities start to grow, which means that the resources are being consumed in greater, greater volumes. 
We should care about this because, again, with the population growth that we've heard about today, we can expect more resources to be consumed. So as we look, uh, sorry, as we look in our local region, this is a time lapse that looks at uh, the local region, DFW region, between 1984 and 2018. And you could see all of the development around the airport. It's starting to encroach upon the airport, which means that everything that happens at the airport and uh, impacts the communities around it a lot more. So the communities are sensitized to the activities that happen at the airport. And we've heard about the drought. I remember distinctly in 2015, the city of Wichita Falls was within less than 60 days of clean water supply. So there's a challenge between water availability, water scarcity, which we heard about today, and the growth of our region. Um, how are we gonna balance those needs? So again, why is an ecosystem approach relevant? Why is it important to us? I think it's shaped the way that we see the world, and I hope to share with you um, inspirations in how we created our model at DFW Airport and how we look at the world. So in early days um, of studying ecosystems, many of, uh, this example is shared in a lot of introductory courses in biology. It's about uh, an island, Borneo, in Southeast Asia. They had a problem with um, malaria from mosquitoes and house flies. And so the World Health Organization decided to introduce DDT the, to kill the mosquitoes and house flies. Well, the geckos who prey upon those um, food sources became poisoned. And then they became susceptible to cats and cats then became um, affected by the poison in the DDT, which meant that the rat population started to grow out of control which created a plague. So again, well-intended human actions and decisions created a series of unintended consequences. That's why it's important to look at our world as an ecosystem because it's so in intimately, intrinsically interconnected and dependent. So this is how we've constructed our ecosystem. Our ecosystem consists of three principal areas. We have the ecological layer, we have land and water on our airport that we care about. We also have infrastructure. That's the roads, the bridges, the, uh, t the runways, taxiways, terminals. Those are all critical infrastructure that we need. And at the center of it, we have a social layer. Those are the people that make the policies and the decisions that operate and manage, that design and build new infrastructure. Each of those areas interact with each other. The other element that we pay attention to is the inputs. These are all of the dependencies that if you take any one of these away, the airport can't function. So think about energy in its various forms. How do we get fuel for aircraft? How do we get energy to power buildings, to move our vehicles? So those are critical dependencies. Think about communications. Uh, without communication systems, we can't guide aircraft safely. Uh, without uh, transportation systems, you can't move people and freight between the airport and the region, or uh, aircraft can't fly. So those are the critical dependencies that we rely on. And then, you heard about this earlier today, these are risks or stressors. These are things that impact our ecosystem that create di uh, unique behavioral changes inside of our ecosystem. We've heard about the technology changes from cyber, uh, things like, um, are you guys familiar with the, we use the term transportation network companies, you guys know it as Lyft, Uber. Those companies, when they started operating at the airport, they, uh, because of the convenience, how connected, accessible, affordable it was, it changed the behaviors of customers using the airport. Instead of parking, they started to be dropped off at curbside, which meant more congestion, more idling, more emissions. So these are uh, unintended actions that happen from those. Uh, think about population growth. As the population growth, there's increased competition for resources. Uh, and that's not only a natural resource, but physical resources, we call it congestion. <laughs> so um, those are some of the stressors. And at the end of the day, we are trying to control the outcomes. They're positive and negative outcomes. 
and my team and I have had numerous conversations about this, how difficult it is to control outcomes if you don't understand all of the dynamics that are happening around you. So we are paying a lot of attention to this. So out outcomes like we connect people, we create jobs. Um, I think you know, there was a Perriman report in 2016 that said DFW generated 37 billion in economic value to the region. I think the number's being updated, but I think it's double that now. Uh, so that's pretty significant. And then from the environmental perspective, we're trying to control the negative outcomes like noise, emissions. Uh, the, American Lung Associated, uh, the American Lung Association gave the Dallas-Fort Worth and, uh, region a uh, grade of F for air quality because of a lot of other contributing factors. And so we don't want to be the one that stands out for contributing the most significant uh, uh, amount to that. So again, the, 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 the thought, the ethos of, uh, that, that Texan My Nature focuses on is balancing business and conservation, bringing those two together. I think quite often those are put in a position where they compete with each other. We're trying to look at it differently. How do we make sure that they work together? So there's a, there's a view that I've shared with our executive team um, that we need to really create a balance between both where we allow the natural um, ecological world to thrive because there are so many benefits that they provide. We heard of the ecosystem services uh, and there's a range of those that we depend on, but we also need to allow the business to thrive. And so one of the areas we're focusing on is biodiversity. We're looking at our campus of 17,000 plus acres, looking at what we have on our property and what where the sensitive areas that we need to protect and conserve are, and what policies do we need to put in place, what actions do we need to take so that we can drive more um, you know, avoidance and, and rest, regeneration, restoration type concepts. So I recently was introduced by one of my advisors to um, this book written by Kate Raworth called Donut Economics. It, I've shared it with all our leadership team and it's really changed, challenged them to change the way they think about the world. It's looking at economic theory today and the way that we think that in order to generate the economics to improve society, you have to use more resources. And so she created a framework that really paints it in, in, in a manner that's very easy and simple to understand. First, she describes um, the mission of sustainability as meeting the needs of all humanity within the means of a living planet. And so to demonstrate that, she created this outer ring that represents the ecological ceiling. If you overshoot that ceiling, you start to see the degradation of the planetary boundaries. You start to see acidification of the oceans. You start to see climate change and all of those effects we've heard about today. The inner ring represents a social foundation where if you fall below that, you see hunger, starvation, equity issues. So the goal is to create a safe space for humanity between the two concentric rings. And that's what we're working on. That's what we want to achieve at the end of the day at DFW. So invariably, we cannot do it alone. I look back at our journey, sustainability journey to being carbon neutral. A lot of those investments, we saw an 80% reduction over the past decade in our footprint. That was using investments that we controlled, investments in renewables, investment in energy efficiency and conservation measures. But when we look at the path that we've set before us and becoming net zero carbon by 2030, which means that we're gonna reduce our footprint as much as possible, and then whatever is residual, we're, we're gonna remove that using nature-based solutions uh, instead of buying offsets to become carbon neutral. So that journey cannot be, is so complex and so challenging. We cannot accomplish that alone. We have to depend on partnerships. And in that group of partnerships, I also will include uh, the, the one that's near and dear to me, my team. Uh, my team is in the back there, some of the members of my team. Um, I couldn't do, we couldn't do the work that we do at DFW without talented individuals, environmental scientists and engineers, who are so creative at connecting the dots between uh, different things that you see in the world and the consequences that they create. And there's a wide list of partners that we work with 
text in my nature has been fantastic to work with, to think about things in a new way. And I've heard a lot of inspiring stories throughout the day that I know we want to continue talking to you guys about. With that, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Hughes, Devin, Magna, and Robert. Incredible presentations. <laughs> Similar to last time, we have Amy and Jenny with microphones if you have uh, questions in the audience. Online, info at texanmynature.org or into the YouTube stream. So we will get started. Any questions to kick us off? Hi, George Cooper, Hill Country Conservancy. I apologize, I forgot your name, the gentleman from Enbridge. Hey, how are you, I'm Devin. Hi, Devin. Do you work with any partners to put urban trails in your rights of ways? Yeah, it's a great question. So urban trails specifically, we've seen those before. I don't, in Texas, we haven't executed on urban trails. We've done pollinators, we've done parks, we've done that type of stuff, outdoor classrooms, those kinds of things. Um, it's, I love the idea of urban trails. In fact, there was one opportunity I can recall down in South Texas uh, that was being explored by a group of folks that ultimately took us outside of our right of way so we weren't able to execute on. But to answer your question short, in concept wise, we love that kind of stuff to where, it, when, it, when it makes sense. Um, the closest thing I could point to that, has, that, that, was, a, that was a large success was us turning um, uh, a, a significant portion of our right of way in South Texas into a pollinator, which for us, whether it's an urban or a trail or a pollinator, it really doesn't matter, right? It's about creating an environmental resource off of what would otherwise just be, you know, a, a pipeline easement, right? So if we can turn that into a, a resource, which allows us to operate, but at the same time creates uh, an a environmental benefit to the community, we, we're always interested in exploring this for sure. Hi, I'm Melanie Ferguson with the Dallas Water Commons. Um, I'm curious to know, Magna, this is a question for you, the Regional Center of Expertise for Education of Sustainable Development. Can you speak more about that and what you do in the region or beyond, how that network works? Yes, absolutely. So um, the United Nations University um, tried to advance the UN Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 with the idea that education can be a critical tool in moving that needle and using um, a global framework for local programs. So um, when I, I found out about it in 2018, there were only seven RCEs, in, uh, six RCEs in the US, uh, and there were 169 across the world, a global collaboration for working on sustainable development goals using, using education, right? So. I came back, I put together a list of 70 stakeholders. Some of you are here in this room who work with me. Um, and so what I did was, collectively, I did a SWOT analysis, uh, got together the group of 70 people to say, these are the challenges for Texas. If you were to uh, work towards these, what do you think are the key SDGs that applies to Texas as a region, right? Because I think you're setting yourself up for failure if you work on all the 17 SDGs at the same time. So collectively, through a brainstorming session, half a day session that we hosted with SWOT analysis, we realized that uh, SDG 4, SDG 2, SDG 9, 11, um, and 13 were the important SDGs for the region, right? So I put together an application. We submitted it to United Nations University based in Kyoto, Japan, um, and they approved us that, okay, Texas can have a regional center of expertise for education on sustainable development to drive the work at a regional level for these five or six SDGs. Um, and since then, we have um, hosted webinars, we have hosted training sessions, we did work here with Trinity Coalition. We actually developed the water quality report card for Trinity to show that it is safe to, um, as Steve is here in the room, uh, to, say, uh, to say that it's safe to uh, go kayaking or use your paddle in the Trinity River. So those are some of the projects. We did a sustainable cities, um, uh, nine month long cohort with city of Dallas and city of Denton as partners where we guided the cities to use UN SDGs as um, something that they can integrate in their strategy and climate action plan or sustainability action plan. And so we do a lot of projects. So if anybody here is interested in 
doing a project and you need some help, right, in terms of resources, but also educational capacity, we are there for you. We'll work with you, we'll bring the stakeholders. Uh, we have applied for lots of funding to get the money to address, you know, even uh, questions like how do you have a regional food assessment study for Texas region to realize, you know, it's hard to believe that one in seven Texan is food insecure. You know, one, 50% um, of college students are food insecure. So all that number, if you try to foot put it together as an assessment study or an actionable item, it's not easy. And so you need a lot of collaborators to work with you. And that's what RCE has been doing for the last three years. We are actually hosting a big summit um, next week. Um, I encourage you all to come and attend two-day sessions focused on all the five SDGs with great panelists and speakers. Thank you, Magna. Thank you. Garrett Boone, this is a question for Devin. Uh, you asked a question at the beginning of your, of your presentation about how do you take an organization and move it from a traditional pathway of making the best investments, maximizing profitability to including you know, charting a sustainable pathway. Ray Anderson, who founded Interface Carpets, charted that, that pathway and wrote about it, and he proved conclusively you can do that, and it's good for the company, you can become a more profitable company, it's better for the shareholders, it's better for employees. He did everything right, so I, if you have not read about him, I encourage you to either go on and listen to his TED Talks, or read his book, Mid-Course Correction, yeah. or see Nathan Havey's a new uh, documentary on Ray Anderson called Beyond Net Zero, because he proved yep. you can do it. And they actually, the interface ended up to be being net, almost net zero in 2020, and now on a pathway of being net plus, where they actually sequester carbon and take toxins out of the atmosphere through their manufacturing process. Yeah, no, I, absolutely, let me, let me be clear. It's, it, it's, it's not that we're sitting here saying, this question doesn't have an answer. It's, it's the question we keep top of mind as we go through an advanced order ESG goals, right? So it's, for us, we're, we're, we're charged with keeping that front of mind as we execute new projects, as we look at existing partnerships. That's what we want to keep front of mind to make sure that we're working toward that. So absolutely, I appreciate that. And Devin, I'd actually like to build on that a little bit um, and, and fuse you as well, because you, have, you see it from a little bit different angle. Um, what are strategies that the audience can use who are, who are earlier in their journey of moving this forward, ways that you've been able to bring all of the uh, different groups within your organization together towards the common goal. Um, is there anything that you've learned or anything that you would recommend as people start this? All right, thanks, uh, Joni. Uh, so yeah, I think it's uh, just bringing together those diverse stakeholders and kind of talking about what do we have in common what are we all uh, working towards? And it's kind of setting that baseline. And then from there, strategies can, can be developed. Yeah, I think it, one of the things on my slide it said that I probably didn't touch on, but it's, you know, it's enterprise-wide alignment, right? So when we released our ESG program, it wasn't just a cool slide and a, you know, some nice thoughts. I mean, we tied executive compensation to, we made it across the entire, entire company that this was going to be a central pillar of the way we execute our business. So when you do that, you, you force alignment and then conversations start. The other big part of this though, and I think it's central to why we're up here is it's great to have that internally, but when you execute on these, that's an external execution. So there's all sorts of stakeholders that are involved. Land, look, landowners, Oftentimes when it comes, most of the time, if not all the time, when it comes to, at least for my business, conservation projects, it is a landowner, it requires landowner buy-in and approval for, it, for us to be able to do that. It's something we've learned a great deal about being able to work directly in with landowners, particularly in the pipeline business, and get their, you know, get them to be a driver of it. So, it, it, kind of a long answer to your, to your question, but it's, it's, it's getting that enterprise-wide alignment for a large company like ours, making it to where all the employees have an incentive when we're, when we're supposed to drive toward it, and then making sure you're carrying that strategy external with stakeholders and partners like Texan by Nature and, and, and many, many others, that you're actually ex executing it externally as well as internally. Thank you, guys. Okay, we have a couple of online questions um, for Robert. I'm gonna kind of combine them, but we've had some inquiries about how the DFW airport um, handles wildlife interactions, both for operations, but then also protecting the natural resources. And then any work with dark skies, and more importantly, how do you communicate 
you know, the work that you're doing for natural resources to the customers that are coming through the DFW airport every day? Really good question. So um, on the first part, um, can you say the first question again? Yeah, they were just asking, you know, there's obviously going to be wildlife interaction. Oh, yeah, sorry. On the property. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, so again, think about this, right? The land, the, the, the folk that uh, bought the land that DFW's built on, that land was, uh, many of pe the people here may have used that land for hunting in the past, right? So there are a lot of um, natural habitat, natural wildlife that existed there before. So when you build the airport, you've displaced them, and now you have to deal with the consequences when they come back into that area. So uh, one of the interactions that we manage very carefully is birds, bird strikes. We try to eliminate the attractants so that you don't have the conflict between aircraft and birds because there's significant damage and there's a high number of bird strike incidents at DFW. So things like um, educating the public about um, things that, like proper disposal of waste so you don't um, have food in places that attract wildlife. Also in our design and construction practices, making sure that the water drains away in, in a reasonable manner so it doesn't accumulate and attract birds because birds attract it to food and water. Um, other areas that we're trying to work in is looking and analyzing. We're doing a, a study right now, a biodiversity study of a campus and trying to understand what exists on our footprint and um, looking at the beneficial species that exist and what ways can we make sure that we don't displace them, we continue to allow them to thrive because they're providing a function whether it's visible or invisible. Um, in addition to the communications, one of the things that we learned early on, and I'm happy that we have uh, a colleague of mine in the audience who's from our communications team, a former reporter, um, we learned that engineers and scientists don't do very well well at communicating. <laughs> <laughs> so we called a friend and uh, we're fortunate to have great partners in our communications department that help us to tell stories. They help us to connect with the right outlets to spread the stories. Um, it's still a challenge because if you think about the passenger journey, they're passing through the terminal in such a short time, trying to get in and out as quickly as possible. How do you get a message that impacts to them? So uh, some of the other ways that we do that is we promote a lot of our work on social media, um, which they follow, and, and we see their interactions on social media. Are you a big TikTok, leap, TikTok user, <laughs> just like Sarah? Uh, tick chat, what? TikTok. <laughs> Say what? Robert, I just went to the airport, and I did see the sign that said, bigger than the island of Manhattan. Yes. 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 So we do have a traveler in front that saw the messaging, bigger than the island of Manhattan. <laughs> we have a question up top. Hi, Lisa Gonzalez with Audubon, Texas. Fantastic presentations, thank you all. Um, my question is for Hughes. So Hughes, I loved that you had a slide with a graph and data. And so my question for you is relating to that graph. How can conservation organizations who are working on nature-based infrastructure issues and natural solution issues, especially as it relates to water, um, better communicate the impact of habitat on uh, things like resilience and, and water issues. I love that you had that graph that showed surface runoff um, that I guess that was related to forest cover over time. So do you have any advice for us as conservation organizations, how we can better use information and data to communicate the message and importance of habitats as it relates to resilience and natural solutions. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Uh, that's a great question. Um, one of the previous panelists talked about KISS, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, and so I think that's a great idea, um, you know, talking about uh, breaking down uh, complex information into little bits of nuggets where, whether that's in an infographic format or a viral TikTok video, I think that's fascinating. But the whole concept of resilience is an important one and one that's getting a lot of attention right now. And so I think focusing on uh, the, the importance of these natural landscapes and nature-based solutions in promoting resilience to uh, a, a state that, that uh, has a lot of challenges from natural disasters and other 
uh, concern. So um, I think a couple of those ideas uh, could be beneficial to helping to, to communicate that message. Thank you, Hughes, and I think that plays directly into Ro what Robert said as far as scientists and engineers mm -hmm. communicating. You don't have to use every data point <laughs> and choose the best one. <laughs> Keep it simple. Hi, um, my name is Cindy Luongo Cassidy, and I'm with the International Dark Sky Association, Texas chapter. Um, I loved your presentations, thank you, and the work that you're doing, I appreciate that. I wonder though, you know, we're being told by biologists that we can protect the land and protect the ecosystems, um, you know, on the land, the plants, etc. But unless we control the light levels that are invading that land, that we will have um, negative impacts on all of the species there. So I notice that in, in all of the work that's being done, that we talk about the land, we talk about you know protecting um, the water. I haven't heard mention protecting um, you know it from light pollution, and I wonder if y'all ever hear that in the work that you do, or feel that that might be as important as protecting the land itself and the water. Robert, can we start with you on that one? I sure. So the, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know that I've heard a lot about light pollution at an airport because if you think about the airport, the airports are defined as critical infrastructure, and so for safety reasons, we have to um, we have to deal we have to deal with that challenge. Um, however, the the point I was making earlier in terms of as policymakers, we have a responsibility to understand the unintended consequences of our decisions. And as we're exploring uh, the biodiversity of the airport, we need to know what, how our development actions are affecting the natural habitat as well. So we will eventually get there. So if you have lessons learned that you can share, we'd be happy to. <laughs> and Magna, have you guys participated in Lights Out and done some lighting changes at UT Arlington as well? No, um, again, for us also it is a security reasons because students have classes at night, so it's important for us to keep the lights on for, uh, for their safety. But, um, you know, I think light pollution, noise pollution, these things often get ignored, and I think they are important uh, to be talked about and integrated in your operational strategy, and I think, uh, you know, the work that Texan by Nature is doing is amazing in that effect. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of echo both and also add a little bit that, um, a lot of times, like, so let's take a, a compressor station or something that, that may be out by itself or, or maybe, it's, maybe it's near some population. Sometimes, also critical infrastructure, so we also have some requirements, but that doesn't mean, just because for us on that one facility, doesn't mean that there's not a conversation to be had, right? So sometimes it takes a stakeholder coming and talking to us saying, hey, were you aware of this? Is there a creative solution? I feel like sometimes we, we are, both sides are either afraid to have that conversation or we just think there's no conversation to be had. I can tell you the way we approach it, the way we engage with our communities, we want to have those conversations, but don't always assume that we know about it, right? So let's, let's have that conversation, see if there's an opportunity, maybe there's a way that we can meet our, our compliance requirements and also still you know, address, address the light pollution and, and, and see what creative solutions are out there. I think that's really important. I think that's something that meetings like this also bring to bear as well. Absolutely, did you want to? Yeah, yeah, just real quick. Uh, one of those creative solutions could be uh, increasing tree canopy within our communities uh, to block out some of those uh, lights. And I will speak for Bill Wren that I know is in the crowd where a lot of times it's just turning our lights down. Yeah. So. To, to build a little bit on that, there are best practices in lighting available. I know you can probably find them on Audubon Texas' site, you can find them on our site, you can find them on the International Dark Sky um, Associ Association site. And it, it's not about dark ground. Um, that's a lot of the pushback that we see in Lights Out Texas is, oh, but safety, we have employees in the building. And in working with um, the, the security folks and the operations folks, the facilities managers, it's about using different fixtures, making sure they're pointed down and not letting the light up above. And if you hold a piece of paper, it's full cutoff lighting and a different temperature. So there are um, opportunities, even if you do need lighting at night. Um, there, are, there are definitely ways to get involved with the, the, the Dark Skies initiatives. 
And this will be the last question. Mine's also for Hughes. I was wondering, I'm thinking selfishly about our watershed here mm -hmm. and the tree growth that you see in our, especially the upper Trinity watershed and how much erosion there is because of how flashy it's become. So I'm wondering if there are particular erosion control measures that affect any of that functionality you were talking about with the benefits of forests for water cleanliness? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so uh, the Texas Water Development Board released a statistic at one point that said that Texas loses 90,000 acre feet of water every year in reservoir storage capacity. And so I think about uh, establishing riparian forest buffers as one way to help hold that soil in place and minimize the impact of erosion into those streams and ultimate uh, sedimentation. Thanks, Hughes. And just want to have one quick wrap-up question. So just the first bullet point that comes to mind. As we wrap up system-level thinking, and, and you guys have each given incredible examples of your journey, the frameworks that you use, the models that may or may not be um, giving you the right answers, uh, but you know, you, you've, you've given fantastic things for us to think about. What is the, if someone's at the start of their journey today, what is you think the biggest thing that they could go back and dig into first? Because you all, all gave a different view and it, it might be overwhelming, but what is like the one thing, if you, you leave here today, is it, a, is it a framework, is it a conversation, is it a seek a partner, what, what is that? And, and Hughes, we'll start with you. Okay, so partnerships. You know, Meg, Megna talked a little bit about how historically we've operated in silos and that's just not gonna be uh, functional or effective going forward. And so partnerships like Texan by Nature and all of you in this room today are to me what the key to, to uh, predicting that future or creating that future. Yeah, I'll give uh, kind of an answer for corporations of like size or, or, or even smaller corporations. I, I think there's a tendency to think that um, from a partnership strategy, it's how many partnership organizations you have, and, and I have a different perspective on that. I've learned over the years it's actually, it's better to find the deeper partnerships that you can create and keep going back to them and lifting them up and creating that relationship. There's more value in that. Um, sometimes if you spread yourself too thin, um, it, it's great to say you're, you're doing all these you know, small projects across the board, but what we want to do is we want to create lasting impact and a, a lasting relationship in communities. So I would say instead of looking around for always bringing on someone new, someone new, go back like the example I gave, kind of reshape the lens. Have you looked at everything? If, 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 there's a, if there's a new initiative, there's a new issue to look at, or some of your existing partnerships, is there an opportunity there to explore? And that's something we've been challenged by and we've really challenged ourselves to do, is to go back, look, who's, who, look who we've partnered with and continue to invest in them and bring them up. I think that's really important. Um, I think I have three, three of those bullet items. First is, what is your bigger vision? Your, uh, your vision has to fit into the narrative, not just for your organization, uh, but also for your region or our country um, or the global perspective, right? So what is the bigger vision? The, the second is what is your story? What story are you trying to tell to your organizations, to your customers, to your stakeholders? And it's important to uh, have a clarity of thought on that aspect. And the third is uh, build a better, strong uh, bottoms up and have, have that with good data because you go farther along in the journey and you realize, oh, I didn't measure this in 2015 and I, now I don't know how to improve. That really uh, puts you back uh, in terms of progress. So having um, that solid foundation really helps. Thank you, Robert. I'm gonna say two things. Uh, one is converse, candid conversations because um, having candid conversations with internal stakeholders, um, you got to understand how their problems connected to a common source. I mentioned connecting the dots earlier. Having those candid conversations helps to expose what people care about, what bothers them the most, and that's where you can find synergies and actions. The second is measurement. If you don't uh, start measuring what's happening, you're not able to connect uh, um, consequences to um, actions. actions. Thank you. Please join me in thanking our panelists. we will have a 30 minute break. Um, please join us back here at three o'clock. And for those of you online, we'll be back 
exactly at three o'clock. You can still send questions into info at texanbynature.org or the YouTube stream. But we'll see you back in about half an hour. Thank you guys.